It's November the 5th, it's election day, and we are still in Pittsburgh. Last night, after interviewing people outside the Trump rally, of course, we had to go in. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. What was it like? Loud, extremely intoxicating for about five minutes, and then ultimately quite tedious. When the man himself finally did come on stage, he was rambly, incoherent, and only occasionally funny. So many people mentioned groceries that Beautiful but simple word, groceries. Earlier today, we went to a Votes and Vibes encampment at the university with lots of well-meaning students. I want you to vote in 2024. So top of my mind, this election, as a woman, reproductive rights are really important to me. I support access to IVF, I support access to birth control, and I think abortion should be legal. I think Re Roe v. Wade should be restored. I didn't really want a Supreme Court that was majority conservative, especially with the conservative justice being kind of old. They might retire and replace them with younger ones like we saw with Kavanaugh. People like Donald Trump, and a lot of Republican politicians think that they have a right to a woman's body. Not, it's not a decision between her and her doctor. For Donald Trump, it's a decision that he wants to decide for women. Vivek has made it a big part of his campaigning recently that you simply cannot find a US conservative on a campus here. So we tried to find one. And pretty easily, we did. I was a bit nervous to put on the hat. I've gotten a lot of looks today. I've had a few people in traffic swear at me, insult me. I've been called things like racist, bigot. So I do think uh, conservatives on campus, I do think they, they face um, the name calling and a sort of discrimination of sorts. Much like we did in the UK, we're gonna stay up now all night and watch this election. Or at least we would if we could find a party that was gonna be on beyond one o'clock. Seemingly in America, that just isn't really a thing, but we will find it if it exists. In 2016, there was one key moment people in the Democrat party still talk about. A moment at which the vibe shifted, which they realized very suddenly that they were going to lose. And maybe we'll find tonight the same vibe shift moment, or one in the opposite direction, at which the vibe shifts from whatever the vibe currently is to whatever it will be for the next four years. On to the funicular. Aujourd'hui, c'est nécessaire de demander qu'est-ce que c'est les vibes. We spent a little bit too much time in cities so far, so we're heading out to a rural county, Beaver, which is just northwest of Pittsburgh, to find out what those voters are thinking about in this election. My name's Debbie Fantone. I'm in a really small town of Industry, Pennsylvania, in Beaver County. I'm one of the volunteers of the Republican Committee of Beaver County here at the office. We came across the bridge from Pittsburgh and we saw this extraordinary glittery giant factory. What does okay, that do? That is the Shell Cracker plant, ethanol plant. That was built maybe about five years ago that Shell has it. And it brought a lot of jobs into the community. And down the way on the river is uh, our Montgomery Lock and Dam. That's an industry. And that's going to get a whole redo with uh, infrastructure money. That's going to take care of that because it's really old, needs to be redone. So I live actually right on the river, so it's just a small town. You blink your eye, and then you go to shipping port after that. That's a nuclear power plant. So I live between two plants, so I glow. <laughs> what I find really amazing about America is that you don't have all-night watch parties. So we've been trying to find an all-night watch party, because in, in, in England, this is, this is, this is our a, first all-night all watch party that I've ever been to, and I'm 65 years old. And I was a Democrat for like 40 years. I actually volunteered in the office for Obama for his first term and made phone calls. After he got in, he lied about stuff. So then I turned Republican, and that's the truth. But your first time voting for a Republican was? Trump. Trump. First time. <laughs> We've just gone past a house absolutely decked out, not in Halloween uh, gear, which we've seen a lot of, but in an extraordinary number of Trump signs and flags. When you're thinking about Trump, because Trump's been, you know, has said a lot of things, what are the things that appeal to you about Trump? I feel as though he could come in and sit down at Granny's kitchen table, and I could just say to him, what the hell's going on, Donnie? And he would say, you know, hey, Granny, it's like this, and he'd tell the truth. I mean, the man's too honest to lie, right? This used to be a Democrat state. Why do you think the Democrats lost it to I so many people? I used to be a Democrat. Yeah. Yeah, but it used to be a Democrat, and they, they just lie. 
and all this woke and boys going into the girls' room and playing girls' sports, and I just can't take it. What do you think is going to happen to America over the next 10 years? The world needs to fear us. Right now, the world laughs at us. I mean, if I was a leader of Russia or China, would you be scared? I'm, I wouldn't be scared. But with Trump, they don't know what he's going to do. And if he says it, it's probably already in place. Is the same true of Israel? Because Israel is obviously an ally of the United States. How do you, how do you think about that? That's been terrible. We should have given Israel anything they needed, everything they needed. It would have been over. I guess it would, it, some people say it would have been over in a very brutal way. It would have been over with lots of loss of life, even more than there's already been. It started in a brutal way. I mean, it started in a, think about what happened to Israel. That was brutal. everybody. I said the only thing would make Donald Trump a better president if I was his VP. I'd tell him, Donnie, hold my Pepsi. I got this one. So we have stumbled across a Republican watch party entirely by accident. You've got it, they're calling it AV because the, uh, the the TV of the Republican watch. We kind of, like I'm AV. You've got you've got some uh, British journalists who turn up who who are actually AV, but we haven't managed to fix their TV. So who knows if they have anything to watch? But we should be on HDMI one. All this money in American politics and. Uh, we still can get the TV to turn on properly, you know? But we are now here at the Democratic Committee. This used to be a Democrat, like, stronghold, right? And then over the last three elections, it's really shifted towards the red, which was Trump. I wouldn't say that. I would say it's a very swingy district. We tend to not vote consistently. Like, if somebody could vote for a Republican president and a Democratic congressman, for example, that it was a lot of ticket splitting that happens here. Has Harris done enough on the economy, given that what we've heard at most of the Harris rallies we've been to mm -hmm. has mostly been about those other issues, reproductive rights, which mm -hmm. are, of course, are extremely important. Yeah. But we haven't heard a lot about the economy, about inflation. And it feels like that sort of blue-collar sector of Democrat workers perhaps hasn't been feeling that message coming through. What do you say to that? I think she's been talking a lot about the economy. I think she's talking about the things that would make the economy better. Um, her opponent is talking about taxing us an extra $4,000 a year with tariffs. She's talking about making sure that housing is more affordable, that health care is more affordable, that our groceries are more affordable. What happened in Beaver County is we lost industry. And, and so trying to replace that with, with new jobs um, moving forward is what will help the economy in the long term. I think she's been talking a lot about the economy, and she is focused on helping the middle class um, instead of, you know, somebody's billionaire buddies. We were just in Pittsburgh and we had a conversation with a Democratic voter there who was sort of seemingly disbelieving that there were any reasonable Republicans left. This is a very different county, right? Mm -hmm. You live amongst Republicans. You have friends, I'm sure, who are Republicans. Sure. Is there a problem with that sort of split still? Um, so I, I would push back. I think there are some reasonable Republicans out there. I mean, certainly there's a louder bunch um, that are a little more extreme, let's say, um, and, and and they get a lot of attention because they make a lot of noise. Uh, but I think, I think I want to believe that in general, the American people are good people. So we're here at a polling station in Beaver County. Uh, we're not quite sure what we're trying to find here. There is a breaking news van, nothing very much breaking yet but uh, the first results will be out in about half an hour. You're a poll worker here. I am a poll worker, yeah. How's it been today? Very busy. So we're about 85%, um, which is really unheard of for our precinct. Um, we had about over 285 melons, and we're at almost 700. Um, it actually came out today, so it's super exciting. Um, bigger, probably the biggest that we've had for presidential. I've been working the polls since Obama. There's loads of conspiracy theories in this election about election interference. Obviously, I'm assuming you haven't seen any of that inside. We have not, so we've had a watcher here all day. Um, we've actually had two of them. When we came across the bridge from Pittsburgh, we saw on our left this extraordinary factory. Do you think it's a Shell factory? That's a brand new factory, a fracking company, you know, Shell. And there's, what, I think 300 and some people there working. That's it. So um, that's one of my focuses. I want to bring some economic development to this area. We need it. We used to be one of the largest places in the world, the best place to work. JNL Steel was incredible. You know, there was 15,000 guys working out of JNL Steel in L equipment. That's gone.
it's five to eight. That means that it is time for polls to close. And we're going to the Republican watch party to see them. We're back and I hope they have the TV working because otherwise it's going to be a bit of a damp squib of a watch party. They've locked it. They've locked it. <laughs> oh no, so the guy was hanging around the corner, right? So that's... We can't get in. Oh no, here we are. It's pumping. It's pumping. How you guys doing? You got the TV working? I did. You did it. I did it. This is really what the American election is about, right? It's not about getting together with your mates in the pub. It's not about canvassing. It's about sitting and watching the amazing spectacle unfold on TV. And then going to sleep at like 11 o'clock. I was interviewed by Owen Jones yesterday and afterwards people in line, I was in line for the Trump rally and he kept trying to trap me into saying that cutting $2 trillion in waste was, a, was not um, possible in our government and it was a mistake. And then he tried to say that all these employees of Donald J. Trump came out and said that he wasn't paying wages and he's going to cancel overtime. And I'm like, that's not true. Prove that to me. So, Did he prove it to you? No, he walked away. In the dereliction of his duty, Owen Jones. I, I was Democrat most of my life, um, even a committee woman. But uh, whenever the morals changed and the values changed, and it seemed like the um, Republicans were more for the working people, I, I had no choice but to switch. This is a traditionally blue collar area. Many people here voted for Democrat in the past. Those people seem to have lost they trust in the Democrat Party. There's been a sort of a, a move away from them towards the Republicans. Do you see the Democrats as having lost this place, or do you think the Republicans have got a strong, clear message that works here? I think in a way that the Democrats have lost it, but hopefully we'll get uh, the economy back on track and be able to uh, get inflation under control, and obviously that affects everybody's pocketbooks at the end of the day, and so that'll uh, trickle-down effect will come back here to the, the state level and the county level as well. You mentioned you were from a military family. Is war and peace, are those major concerns for you? Oh, absolutely. 100%, yes. Did you see that Liz Cheney is now backing Harris? Yes. Yeah, because she is a warmonger just like her father. How did Halliburton, Halliburton make all their money? First they go in, they destroy a country, then Halliburton builds it back up. That's how they make their money. It's not right. Do you find what's going on in, in Gaza in particular concerning? Does that speak to you? The innocent victims, um, my heart just goes out to them. Um, you know, the civilians, I, I just believe that we have to protect, you know, the innocent people. And especially, like, um, like I said, in Israel, you know, God's country, we just need to. God's country? Yes, God's country. Mm -hmm. I, I wonder the if Jews. you... Go on, go on. <laughs> yes, the Jews. <laughs> We're heading back now towards Pittsburgh. It's five to nine in the evening. And we've just heard that Trump has won Miami-Dade County, which is the Miami area in Florida. He's also won the whole state of Florida, of course. But that county is particularly crucial because no other Republican candidate has won it since 1988 and George uh, Bush Sr. It's one of several bellwether counties. So we have the idea of the bellwether states, but also the bellwether counties that determine and shift with the whole of the electoral map. We're now going to Pittsburgh. We're going to talk to the DSA, that's the Democratic Socialists of America, to see if we can get a sort of richer class analysis from the left about what's happened tonight. Let's do some class analysis. This used to be a Democratic state very solidly. Have the Democrat Party lost this state or have the Republicans gained it? Pennsylvania, from the middle of the 20th century, was a manufacturing hub. It was one of the key points of production during the Second World War, and it carried that forward into being a place where people made things for a living, steel was produced here, and all the precursors to make steel. The reason that I imagine that Pittsburgh and Western Pennsylvania, and to the extent any other Rust Belt state would have moved from a Democratic uh, stronghold to a Republican one is based on who they're courting and the promises they're making. And since the Clinton administration and since the neoliberal policies have dominated the Democratic talking points, we're simply not seeing things promised to working class manufacturing sectors in this country. The majority of Americans, I think, and I 
cannot quote the exact number, but definitely over 50%, and I think closer to 70%, support universal health care. Um, they support things like childcare, um, you know, mandatory maternity leave, those kind of things. Um, and the Democrats have, I would not, you know, I would say that it is a coin flip on whether they will actually act on those policies. Um, whereas obviously the Republicans and the GOP are 100% um, against those policies. You know, in order to really support, you know, to get away from that neoliberalism, they need to actually start supporting policies that are supported by the people of America. Perhaps the major issue at stake for people who are talking to in Detroit and Dearborn in particular, who are Arab Americans and Muslim Americans, was whether or not to vote for Harris at all, given that she's basically supported the ongoing genocide in Gaza. How do you wrestle with that? So the question of Gaza and organizing around it was one of the main organizing and one of the most hotly debated topics at the Chicago Convention in 2023. Um, it was sort of one of the biggest divides we have. And it's a Jewish person and a union officer who pushed my local to put out a statement on Gaza in November of 2023 calling for a ceasefire. It was a. It's good to know that the party that I was in and supporting and putting my time behind was willing to be out front on this issue. Um, I think despite our efforts and many efforts, even within the Democratic Party, to sort of make this a top line issue for them. It has been refused at the Democratic Convention, it's been refused in the media, and we may be seeing the results of that now. Maybe one of the most effective ways in which the war machine can be opposed is by actually doing direct action against production facilities. Um, I would describe these efforts as laudable, uh, maybe some of the most important things that are happening in the sphere. In America, firearms are a reality of daily life. Everyone from a Walmart security guard at a retail location could be armed with a deadly weapon possible, like able to kill a person in a moment. That sort of threat of deadly violence is always going to be present whenever entering unauthorized areas. Everything from somebody's vacant properties to uh, stealing from a 7-Eleven could be faced with this. I mean, in, in terms of like my gut reaction to like why isn't it happening here is like, it's going to basically be a life or death struggle every single time you engage with it. Political violence is not just a right wing tradition, it's also a left wing tradition. Does the right to storm the capital have to be defended for the left? People are looking <laughs> <laughs> This is a good question. Um, I know people definitely joked, like, oh, people are storming the capital. Yay! Just kidding, it's the fascists. Boo. Like, I mean, the possibility of revolution is so attractive to the left, but in theory, like, it's, it's hard. I mean, are you willing to die for something is such a huge question. And like, are you? <laughs> like I said, I, I would have to think about it a lot. I think there are things I would be willing to die for, but I'd really have to reckon with it. And I'd really have to see it be a pivotal moment. And I think because we're kind of the frog in the pot that's getting cooked, right? We're, we're in fascism, but everyone thinks there's going to be a moment where it's, oh, now it's fascism for real. And at what moment does the frog realize it's getting cooked and decide, okay, I'm going to jump out of the pot and risk the fire instead of the pan? It's hard to decide. We just left the bar with the Democratic Socialists of America who were extremely articulate and extremely bleak. It looked from the coverage that we could see behind us that Trump was doing really, really very well. There's a thing called the Red Mirage, which is this idea that those voters for Trump, particularly rural voters, get their votes counted early because there are fewer ballots. And then later on during the night, it kind of shifts blue. I'm not that hopeful. It's sort of borderline whether or not she'll win the popular vote, which Democrats have won for the last five elections. We're in downtown Pittsburgh, basically empty. We were told by the DSA that there wasn't really much of a nightlife uh, in this city. And that's certainly true even on election day. Even though there's no one out here, you can sort of feel maybe this is just projection, that the vibe has shifted towards something like a Trump victory. The New York Times, in fact, was just projecting a 75% chance of a Trump victory. Some of the money markets have him at 90. You're seeing Trump winning? Yeah, Trump winning. How does that make you feel? Good. We're journalists from England. How are you doing? You know there's an election on tonight? You don't want to talk about the election. Have you seen the news? I've seen the news and I've seen the political aspect of everything. And I love politicians, I love political aspects. And people, somebody has to govern something or we'll go crazy trying to govern ourselves. So it looks like Trump's gonna win. Yeah, it's definitely, it's looking that way. For yeah, sure. it's really looking that way. How do you feel? I mean, 
it's all right. But, but like the women, you don't seem not the accused. Reproduct- <laughs> the, the reproductive health is important. But like yep. that's really like my main reasoning. So I got to say. Yep. But like, hey, America, man, I'm proud of it either way. I'm indifferent, man. You're different. Yeah, I've, I'm 35. I've voted in three elections now, and I haven't seen the economy change. It's only gotten worse, so I really don't care who wins. I want Kamala to win because, one, Trump's trying to stop SSI and stuff like that, and my sister get SSI. She has Down syndrome, so I definitely don't support that. How's it going? No comment. I think Trump is going to win. My dad fought in World War II, and I have to say... If he was alive today, as long with all the other veterans that fought in the World War II and saw everything going on with the Jewish people and Israel, and it, it's a, it's appalling. It is really appalling. There's so much hate, and you could be you, you can disagree with someone, but you don't have to hate them for it. Talking about anti-Semitism now, so you're referring to the Holocaust here, right? Oh, sure, the yes. industrial murder of yeah, six million I'm, Jews. I'm sh- I am shocked that it has. Um, you know, resurrected here in the United States again. I, I agree, anti-Semitism is out there, but can you be more precise? Um, I think that one, the first thing is people have gotten away from God in their life. So that's where the hate comes in. The second thing is we're all shocked at some of the, the main educational and academic institutions in the United States of America have supported anti-Semitism. In the form of saying things like free Palestine and so on? Well, yes, they don't understand. We're, I mean, we, it's not that we want Palestinians to be killed or murdered or hurt, but what is the number? 70 to 80% of the Palestinians are Hamas? That seems slightly unlikely to me, but go on. War is not fair. It never was biblically, and it isn't now. So unfortunately, and I don't say take this lightly, people do get killed. Do you see this as a biblical war? That's a, that's a strange, interesting reference. It is. It is a biblical war. And if you're familiar with the book of Revelations, you won't be surprised at what's going on. Do you believe that, for example, some beliefs the Christian Zionists said that this is sort of bringing about the end times, that, they're, that moving the Jews to Jerusalem, yes. particularly, is going to bring about the end times? Is that something that you think? Um, yes. Um, none of us know the day or the time or the hour because that's written in Scripture. But if you read Revelations, and everybody should, You will be um, astounded at all the things that are happening now that coincide and validate everything that's written in Revelations. Do you think Trump has a part to play in that that story of Revelations? Well, I think God raises kings, raises people in authority. And I think that what I've looked at the last few days, you know, God is raising great men. Trump, Elon Musk, I mean, Joe Rogan. We're in. How are you feeling about tonight? Well, you know, I was originally expecting it to be a Democrat win, but Republicans are doing pretty good uh, throughout the state, so. I would say they're terrified. I would say they're really scared about what a Trump victory means to this country. What do you say to the people who are, you know, at the right now, feeling quite a lot of fear? I think it's unrealistic to think that, you know, Trump's going to do anything negative towards our country. I think every politician comes into the United States wanting to make positive change. He's making great inroads with uh, African-American votes, with Hispanic male votes, and just across the board, um, all the numbers look like they're going up. Oh my God, I love, I listen. For Trump. I, I, I voted Democrat for the last 20 years, actually, and I feel victimized by the party. I feel like they could have codified Roe v. Wade in the five plus decades that they had, but they chose not to so that they could keep women voters with a gun to their head talk, for, for voting. And it sickens me. Well, All of my, li- I can't even go near my liberal girlfriends at this point because they're just like subscribed to like this insidious liberal rhetoric. Why should we give our money to anyone else but this country? I'm an isolationist. For sure. If you understand anything about American politics, it's like, why is everybody giving their money to? Israel to Ukraine, no one gives a fuck. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna keep, no one gives a shit. It's just like, I, I'm gonna vote for someone because they're a fucking woman. Actually, if no one gives a fuck. they have a pussy fu- but not a brain, no one cares. As long as they have a pussy, they'll vote for her. 
Sorry. I think independence of thought is crucial, and it's nearly impossible. I I do not subscribe to the uh, commercial-free YouTubes. Religion uh, is fine with me, but I... I uh, she, that's she's why naked. there are still issues, though. Like, if we would just collectively say, I like, don't religion care. I'm is not, I'm not gonna be that antiquated, that's, that's, let's that's, get rid of it, impossible. it would, it would solve a lot impossible. of issues. But religion. I still went out and voted for Trump. Do you see? I would have loved to see. Do you see support for Israel as wasteful spending? Uh, well, I don't. I love. Chris see, we we can are all all day. We're all day. We made Mike Pence swear her in on the Bible instead of the Bible. I love that for her. And then we have Kamala Harris. Wendy Brown makes a very good point in her, um, her book on neoliberalism about, and the rise of the far right, about the deep feeling of nihilism and the feeling that nothing matters and the feeling that everything is just completely pointless and therefore you might as well intensify and intensify politics until it becomes just this thing that you can uh, believe in. And when I talk to people like that, I feel there's such a deep truth to that, that the Trump vote is really not a vote about politics. In fact, apart from the people who we talk to who have been sort of blue collar workers, disappointed by the Democrats, which I completely understand. Most people who we've spoken to haven't even had like the inkling of like a real political concern, but just want to intensify their experience intensify the experience of the the spectacle that surrounds them, the endless series of screens. And I feel really shit. Like, I feel really, really shit. <laughs> There's a... The Trump victory, which is now looking almost certain. For everything the Democrats are shit on, the Trump victory will seriously, seriously harm lots of people. Millions of people, possibly billions of people worldwide. His economic policies probably won't work. And they, they, if they work for the American working class, they'll hurt the working class elsewhere. His cultural politics will be a disaster. There will be much more violence against women, against minorities. It's a really fucking bad night. We've come to the Democratic Party's party uh, for this election, uh, which is supposed to be here at the, the Ruckus Room event space. As you can see, not very ruckus inside. Um, in fact, everyone seems to have gone home. The only person here in the car park is someone from the local news channel. It's very difficult to overestimate the extent of the international implications of what's happened here. Um, Trumpism was never quite a domestic phenomena, right? It was also connected to a much wider network of the global far right, in fact, which it sat at the, the center of from which it organized uh, across the world. People who support Bolsonaro in Brazil will be celebrating tonight as they might see this as a potential path back to power for them. People in India who were chastened in the recent elections by the Congress party might be celebrating as well. And certainly Benjamin Netanyahu in Israel will be celebrating because this victory will almost certainly give him carte blanche to accelerate the genocide against the Palestinians in Gaza. In the UK context, Farage and Tony Robertson will both be pleased about this, as will Kemi Badenoch, who I believe, while I've been away, has become the leader of the Conservative Party, which I was not expecting. Like, for all the incredible humour of Trump as a candidate, there is a brutal truth to him as a, a politician and the people he surrounds himself with. Violence will become much worse. Climate change will accelerate. This is really a disastrous result for the entire globe. And to celebrate that disastrous result, we're going to go, like many Americans do, to the casino to drive home the nihilism of what it is to be alive right now. So they just called Pennsylvania for Trump. So it's over. And uh, calls for a costume change. Oh. 
We just yeah. we just heard that Donald Trump won Pennsylvania. That seems like he won the presidency now. Uh, there, it's inevitable. They just said on the TV they haven't talked much in this campaign about foreign policy or much on the TV about foreign policy. But imagine the celebrations in Israel tonight. It's all lies. Trump is a good person. God is with Trump, and I believe in God, and he's going to do good. We were both there when he took the bullet. There were two people that were critically injured in the stands that we were sitting in. He took a bullet for us. I think Donald Trump wants to do the right thing with everything. Yes! When I look at America, I see the world's most powerful, richest empire that's ever been, that spans the entire globe and that dominates almost every other country in the world. And this psychodrama that it has got itself into, in which it imagines itself to be beset by enemies at every turn, to be somehow the victim, somehow vulnerable, There are real deep-seated problems in the country, real profound inequality here, real profound poverty and anime and a loss of meaning. And yet the intensity of that psychodrama is almost inexplicable to me. Just overjoyed, praising God, and just, it's a miracle, a total miracle, what the fake media has done to him, what all of the, the liberals have done to him, and they tried to kill him twice and what has happened it's the hand of God it's absolutely incredible to get our country back to godly biblical principles and to get the economy back on track to use our own resources drill baby drill use our own oil be independent and have jobs created in this country not cars being made in Mexico from China building factories it's just, it's over, it's just overwhelming. It's incredible. We're just so thrilled, so, so happy. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. The Harris campaign was abominable. They refused to come out against genocide. They refused to speak meaningfully to people who, whose lives have been made worse under Biden. Not perhaps for Biden's own economic policy reasons, but because of the inflation that came out of COVID. They refuse to speak meaningfully to people's anxieties. And this is the consequence of not only Trump's extraordinary capacity as a campaigner, but the Democrats' complete refusal to engage meaningfully with what people worry about, even if they are still the richest country by a very long way in the entire world. This is their fault.